Hello everyone. My name is Prince Gupta. I'm a product manager at Qualcomm and I help build technologies that power XR devices. Holographic telepresence was once only imaginable in sci-fi movies like Star Wars. Today, we will take a look at technologies that are making this vision of XR a reality. I'm going to do this by walking you through key perception technologies that are needed, explain why they are important, and what are the key performance indicators or KPIs for each technology which impacts the user experience. At the end, I'm also going to show you a concrete example of how we are making this vision of XR a reality. The vision and promise of XR is pretty clear. Imagine collaborating with people from different geographic locations, but with an XR experience that feels like you're actually sitting across the table and talking in person. To realize this vision, the XR glasses need to be light and small for a comfortable wear for long durations. This puts a physical limit on the size of the glasses, specifically the temples and the rim of the glasses. Given this constraint, if we calculate the total surface area of the glasses and the amount of heat that can be dissipated from that surface area, we get a limit of about one watt of power that can be dissipated from these glasses. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about a number of perception technologies and algorithms and explain why they are important and what are their KPIs. But you will see a recurring theme here that to optimize the power of all these perception technologies to be able to fit them on glasses that can only dissipate one watt of power is the key challenge to be solved to realize this vision. In December of last year, Qualcomm launched the Snapdragon XR2 chipset. As we walk through these different technologies, I will also illustrate how Snapdragon XR2 is enabling these technologies today. Perception is our ability to see, hear, or become aware through our senses. As humans, we perceive through our eyes, ears, and nose. Machines perceive through sensors like camera, accelerometer, or gyroscope. Perception technologies are a set of algorithms that take input from these sensors and make the device aware of two things. First is the user, and second is the user's environment. User understanding includes tracking everything about the user's body, including head, hand, legs, even where the user's eyes are looking at and how facial expressions are changing. Also, mapping a user's face to a photorealistic avatar or a virtual clone to give a sense of real presence. Environment understanding includes things like light estimation, which senses how the space is lit up, 3D reconstruction, which senses what and where the surfaces are in the environment, and semantic understanding, which recognizes the objects in the environment, like a sofa, chair, or table. Before we deep dive into each technology area, let's look at the KPIs that are common across all the technologies. First is accuracy. How accurate is the output of the algorithm compared to absolute perfect result, also referred to as ground truth. This is usually measured as an error metric or a percentage. Second is robustness. Robustness is how resilient is the algorithm to corner cases. And last but not the least is power. How optimized is the power consumption of the algorithm? Head tracking technology tracks the head movement of the user wearing the HMD. In a holographic telepresence use case, this information is used to map user's head movement to avatar's head movement. The rotation of the user's head, which is yaw, pitch, and roll, accounts for three degrees of freedom. And if the user's is moving, then the translation accounts for the other three degrees of freedom making a full six degrees of freedom tracking algorithm. The algorithm not only calculates where the user's head is now, but also predicts where the user's head will be in the future, usually 10 to 20 milliseconds out in the future. As you can imagine, this algorithm needs to run all the time at very low latency, high accuracy, high robustness, and low power consumption. Accuracy for head tracking is measured in translation and rotation error. For high accuracy, Snapdragon XR2 head tracking algorithm supports features like mapping the environment. Robustness, which is resilience to corner cases, like if your hand is covering one of the camera or lighting is too dark in the room or you are in a textureless environment. For this, XR2 head tracking uses specialized cameras which are wide field of view, monochrome and global shutter and implement features like relocation to recover if the tracking is lost. 
on Snapdragon XR2 chipset, we implemented parts of this algorithm in silicon in hardware, as opposed to running them in software to make the power consumption of the algorithm much lower compared to an all software implementation. Eye tracking technology tracks where the user is looking at, also known as the gaze vector. In a holographic telepresence use case, just imagine if we don't have eye tracking information. The avatar would look dear eye. Eye tracking information can be used to manipulate avatar's eye movement mapped to the user's eye movement. Eye tracking can also be used for a feature called foveated rendering which renders high resolution where the user is looking at and fills rest of the display with low resolution content, thus optimizing the total power consumption of the system. As you can imagine, our eyes move very fast. Therefore, the eye tracking algorithm needs to be very low latency, usually less than 10 milliseconds for the entire end-to-end -end pipeline. We have partnered with Toby, a company that provides the industry leading eye tracking algorithms to bring eye tracking on Snapdragon XR2, implemented on the DSP core to have low latency access to the cameras and also power efficient processing. Robustness in eye tracking is measured as a population coverage. As people from different countries have different eye features, therefore eye tracking algorithms should be resilient to different types of eyes. This is done by training the eye tracking neural network on a large data set with sufficient population coverage. Hand tracking technology is used to build a fully articulated skeletal hand model of the user. Going back to our use case of holographic telepresence, if you are talking to a virtual avatar, it's just natural to see how the avatar hands are moving. The fidelity of hand tracking is measured in 26 degrees of freedom. You get 26 by adding all the joints of the hands, including each finger. One very important KPI for hand tracking is the track field of view. As humans, we naturally expect a large tracking volume for hands, if the hands are on top of our head or below on our waistline. Robustness in hand tracking is very important as there are many difficult corner cases possible, like intertwined finger or one hand occluded by another. Latency is also critical in hand tracking, as you do not want to feel your virtual hands lagging your real hand movement. Most hand tracking algorithms are implemented using neural networks. For that, Snapdragon XR2 chipset provide capability of 15 trillion operations per second for these neural network computation. Till now, we've talked about head, hands, and eyes. This makes up the kind of avatars you must already be familiar with in AR and VR systems today. Now let me talk to you about some future technologies which will be needed to take the realism of the avatars to the next level. To realize this future vision of holographic telepresence, we also need body tracking, facial tracking, and photorealistic avatars. And the same principles of accuracy, robustness, and power apply to these as well. Body tracking needs to accurately map all movement of the body. Facial tracking needs to pick up micro expressions of the face to be able to relay not just messages, but also emotions. And finally, texture of the face needs to be mapped to the avatar to create photorealistic avatars. Though, as we start to approach photorealism, it is important to recognize the uncanny valley, which is the relationship introduced by a Japanese researcher in 1970. Uncanny valley relationship states that as you start to increase the photorealism, there is a drop in the likability of the avatar until the photorealism is so strong that the avatar starts to look real. Next, we will look at the second category of technologies, which is understanding of the user's environment. Lighting the virtual objects correctly is very important. Otherwise, the virtual objects seem out of place. For example, here, you can easily tell that the cup looks artificial and seems pasted in. Whereas if you account correctly for the environment lighting like this, the virtual content blends with the real world. And humans are very good at sensing this difference. There are four key things to look for when determining whether the lighting is correct or not. First is specular highlights. Specular highlights are the shiny bits of surfaces like the rim of the cup here. Second is shadows. Shadows determine the direction of light in the scene. Third, is shading. 
Shading is how the light is changing on the surface of the object. And fourth is reflections, which is reflections of other objects in the scene. 3D reconstruction technology gives the device information about surfaces in the room, like horizontal planes, vertical planes, or curved surfaces. This information can be used to augment objects in the room which are lashed onto those surfaces or occluded by those surfaces. And the same principles of accuracy, robustness, and power apply here too. The reconstruction needs to be accurate. So if the virtual object is occluded by a physical object, then the edge of the occlusions should not have any errors. The reconstruction needs to be robust to different types of materials, lighting conditions, and changes in the room. All this heavy processing needs to be done power efficiently. Therefore, in Snapdragon XR2, we support hardware accelerated depth from stereo algorithm, which is used as an input to 3D reconstruction. 3D reconstruction gives us information about the surfaces of the objects, whereas semantic understanding tells us what those objects are. It can tell whether what you're looking at is a table or a chair or couch, etc. Why this is important is because now you can really start to have meaningful augmentations in the environment. If the system is putting up an augmented painting, for example, it will know automatically that it makes sense to do that on the wall rather than on the table, for example. In our original holographic telepresence use case, it makes sense to have a virtual object be augmented on a table rather than hanging off the side of the table. So that summarizes all the perception technologies that are needed to get both understanding of the user and understanding of the user's environment. Now, let's take a look at how the brain of the device or the Snapdragon chipset processes information for all these perception technologies. Snapdragon XR2 is purpose-built silicon for XR. It is the world's first XR platform that supports 5G for high speed and low latency connectivity. In addition, it is the first platform ever which supports seven concurrent cameras to receive input for the perception technologies, dedicated computer vision processor for hardware accelerated functions like depth from stereo, supports up to 3K by 3K display per eye, video capability of 8K 60 FPS, and true mixed reality for low latency pass-through. In addition to many of these XR specific features on Snapdragon XR2, it boasts 2x better CPU and GPU capability and 15 trillion operations per second of AI processing. Now, let me show you an example of how all this comes together and makes the vision of holographic telepresence a reality today. We have worked closely with our partners in real and spatial to demonstrate holographic telepresence. This demonstration shows how collaboration should be without the barriers of physical distance and so intuitive and user-friendly, it feels like you're actually sitting across a table and talking in person. In conclusion, we have learned that perception technologies are fundamental to realize the XR vision. And for all perception technologies, accuracy and robustness are key KPIs. In addition, optimizing power consumption for these technologies is critical. Holographic telepresence, which was once only imaginable in sci-fi movies, is becoming a reality today with Snapdragon XR2. Thank you so much for your attention. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. All right. Uh, we are sitting here with Prince Gupta, who just gave us a really great presentation on uh, all these new advancements in, in photorealism and, and, and how um, the, uh, the interaction and the interactivity of XR is going to evolve. Um, Prince, thank you so much for, for that presentation. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, it's uh, awesome to be joining the AWE community uh, like you. Yeah. Um, so jumping right in, there's a question in the chat room that I thought uh, was really great. Um, the question is, will the need to support XR content and interactivity create a need for a different or higher level of attention to indoor lighting sources and quality? Um, this gets to... Um, uh, all of the all of the things that like ray tracing and, and, the, and the indoor lighting um, uh, that, that are that are going on there. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, light estimation, as we talked about in the presentation, is uh, very important whenever augmenting the real world with virtual content. 
the virtual content needs to blend in uh, to the real world. And the key aspect of environment understanding, you know, more than 3D reconstruction, uh, understanding what are the objects in the room, is also how the lighting of the room uh, is, uh, is established. And, you know, we saw some early versions of it in uh, smartphone AR space uh, with AR Core, AR Kit, uh, came out with their light estimation. And we'll see that uh, even all, you know, carrying forward to AR uh, viewers or you know, viewers which are now connected to smartphones. Nice. Um, I'm curious uh, about how you think some of these advancements will impact adoption. Um, do you think that photorealism and, uh, and all the things that you talked about, do you think those will become marketing points for hardware and um, ecosystem uh, developers and adopters. Um, basically, do you think that people are holding off on on um, on really uh, creating this mass market adoption uh, because of the of the realism? And do you think that if people knew that the experience was more real, that they would be more interested in adopting? Mm, that's a great question, uh, Josh. I think uh, you know XR needs to go through this uh, you know crawl, walk, run uh, stages, right? As, as we scale the adoption, uh, first and foremost, you know, before even we come to realism is whether the use case is providing value to the user. Uh, so we have to really establish that, that point and, and establish a value uh, to the user. Once the user sees value in these use cases, and I firmly believe that, that users will, uh, especially as our communication changes uh, over the years, you know, earlier, Everybody used to just communicate through call and text, right? And then came pictures and videos. And, you know, slowly these transformations, I mean, today, who would have imagined that we'd be doing a WWE conference uh, just over, uh, you know, all online, right? Uh, these things will change. Uh, it's, a, it's not, uh, you know, it's a matter of when uh, they will change. So the adoption will happen. So we have to be prepared in terms of developing these technologies, creating these form factors, which will actually enable these these experiences. So the first thing will be establishing the value for the user. And once the value for the user is established for the particular use cases, then uh, more technologies like you know facial uh, avatars, uh, something which is more photorealistic will, will be needed. That's great. Um, we're uh, in our last minute here. Uh, there's some other questions in the chat room uh, that uh, hopefully you have a chance to go in there and, and uh, have a conversation with those attendees. Um, but if folks want to get a hold of you outside of this, if they have additional questions, um, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Uh, uh, social media or email or things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, so you, I think folks can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, happy to share the official emails as well. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us here at AWE Online 2020. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation. Really cool to talk to you today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.